Greetings and welcome to The Dividing Line on a Wednesday, last program of the week, only because I'm heading for uh, Conway, Arkansas. Well, that's I think that's my final destination anyways. Um, we've got a conference this weekend. First travel I've done, oh goodness, at least ministerially since January, I believe. And um, I'll be perfectly honest with you, I'm not looking forward to the travel part at all. Uh, the uh, the uh, walking through the zombie crowds and, and things like that. Uh, but there you go. That's what we're going to be doing. Looking forward to seeing folks there and um, having a good time around the Word of God and uh, be, be back, Lord willing, on Sunday evening uh, if I'm not put on a plane to Botswana or something like that uh, in the process. But need to get to some things uh, before then. Uh, I want to start off with um, a subject that we have dealt with literally for decades. Um, it was the late 1980s when, uh, well, actually, probably the mid-1980s, when I was challenged by a friend, now deceased. Um, you can tell when you've been at something for a while and you have to start talking about, you know, how many people you used to work with that aren't around anymore, um, challenged by a friend uh, to look more closely at the claims of the Roman Catholic Church. We were dealing with uh, Mormonism and Jehovah's Witnesses, and uh, he was a former Roman Catholic, and he said, you know, a lot of the things you're saying about the gospel as taught by these other groups uh, has parallels in what is taught within Roman Catholicism. Well, I was raised as a independent fundamentalist Baptist, or at least GRB Baptist, depending on which church we were in. And my background certainly was not one that put me into a great deal of contact with Lutherans, Presbyterians, Episcopalians, Anglicans, uh, certainly not Charismatics, um, uh, Pentecostals, and certainly not Roman Catholicism. I mean, I've been simply told that Roman Catholicism was a false religious belief, uh, that um, the Pope, it really wasn't the Pope was the Antichrist. Um, that was that, that didn't really fit into a real good premillennial view of things, actually. But, um, but that the, the, it, it was a religion that uh, replaced a, a vital faith with works. And, and of course, I, I did know uh, a number of adult Roman Catholics. They swore a lot. They smoked a lot. They drank a lot. Um, they just didn't seem to take their faith very seriously. That was what most Roman Catholics I knew were, were like. Uh, but they, they got forgiven by going to see the priest, and, and that was about the extent of it. And so it was actually the advent of what is the precursor to the internet that began to expose me to Roman Catholics and to therefore do what I had been doing with these other groups. And I had not been taught to do this, but it was just sort of a natural thing. If you're going to start addressing a particular group, you need to get their original documentation, get their books, read their materials. It was uh, something called the BBS system, Fidonet. Uh, those of you who are old enough to remember those days, uh, the precursor to the Internet. This was even before Al, Al Gore invented the Internet. Uh, and uh, you could have lengthy, long discussions with people. Um, and the nice, there was actually one nice thing about it. Um, you remember the, the, the BBS is sitting there and... and uh, indeed I do. And I... we had Blue Wave. Yep. And I remember we got our first 65 megabyte hard drive. Yeah. Uh, it was we, we huge. Actually, actually, 650 megabyte. Yeah. Hard. I remember that. We we had the um, a phone line installed in my house. Actually, no, two phone lines, wasn't it? Well, we we were doing we started doing Dedicated we started doing that it. stuff down on Camelback. Yeah, true. Yeah, and I'm thinking I'm thinking that there was a system before FidoNet. Not that I was involved. Okay, all right, all right. No, no, because the Open Bible Echo, Mormon Echo, right, 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 stuff right. like that. That yeah. was that was down on Camelback, yeah. and uh, that was in the starting in the mid mid to late eighties yeah, uh, in yeah. that area. Okay, and that's where I first started doing some reading, 
and uh, interacting with people. And like I said, one of the advantages, one of the nice things about that mechanism was you would write a lengthy post. And because of the nature of how this worked, it, it would pack up all the messages that had been put into that node and it would send it off overnight to another node. And you might not get responses for 24 or 48 hours from other people. And so that actually wasn't a bad thing. You, you might think, oh, uh, but it actually gave you time to think, to write. And it sort of lowered the um, emotional level of things. I, I'm, I'm not sure that the instant back and forth that we have today has, I'm pretty sure, in fact, I'm absolutely certain that it has substantially lowered the level of conversation. Um, but anyway, so if you've read certain books, um, Fatal Flaw, Answers to Catholic Claims, The Roman Catholic Controversy, uh, or you know, Letters to a Mormon Elder, Is More of My Brother, a lot of that stuff started uh, really uh, 35 years ago and more. In yeah, yeah, that was all that was all going on back then. So what happened, of course, is that surprisingly led to my first two books were on Roman Catholicism. It was supposed to be one book, it got too big, it got split into two parts, and so it became two books. The Fatal Flaw and Answers to Catholic Claims. Everybody figured my first book would be on Mormonism. That was my third book, Letters to a Mormon Elder. Uh, but the first two books were on the subject of Roman Catholicism very quickly. Uh, that led to the first debate with Jerry Matitix of Catholic Answers in um, Long Beach in August of 1990. So, oh yeah, hey, here we go. August, it's August of, uh, there you go. Yeah, yep, there you go. We, we, we even said we need to remind ourselves, and I was going to look up what the actual date was. Because um, it's got to be someplace. There's got to be somewhere in our old archives of the Dividing Line newsletters. Where are they? They're, they're in your office someplace. Yeah, yeah. See if you can't find um, those old Dividing Lines. And somewhere in there, I bet you there is some reference to what the specific date was. But I, I would bet it's within the next week. I think the next week, in the next week, will mark... Um, the 30th anniversary, 30 years uh, from the, my first moderated public debate with Jerry Matitix, who was at that time, much to the current Catholic answer's chagrin, <laughs> was at that time the, the leading face uh, of apologetics for Catholic answers, Jerry Matitix. And it was at a church, a Roman Catholic church in Long Beach, California. That might actually be somewhere on the blog, too. I wonder if you searched for Long Beach somewhere uh, in all the vast material. I, there's not going to be a tag, but if it was really searched, uh, that, would be, that would be nice. Um, anyway, so 30 years ago this month, we had our first debate with Jerry Matitix. That was followed up with two debates in December of 1990 in, um, in Arizona, one in uh, North Phoenix, at Northwest Community Church, and the next night at City of the Lord, a Roman Catholic Church in Tempe, Arizona. Uh, both with, again, with Jerry Matitix. One was on Perseverance of the Saints, the other was on the papacy, and the second one was, was moderated by Scott Hahn, and uh, ended up with Scott Hahn walking out of that particular debate uh, in a huff after it was over. Anyway, uh, and that's, that's what started stuff. Uh, that's what started uh, eventually the, the great debates on Long Island with Chris Arnzen and all of the various people that we engaged uh, there and in debates in numerous other places, including a couple overseas. But that's not been a, that's not been a real big topic overseas. Um, uh, Peter Williams and I have, have debated um, in uh, London and in uh, Belfast. But uh, I'm trying to think. I, I can't really think of other Roman Catholic debates outside the United States. I think they've all been, been in the United States. So I, we've, we've engaged that subject. The only, the only 
religious group we've engaged more often um, has been uh, Islam. Um, I, I counted it up once, and it was uh, it was Islam. Now is the most most common. Then it was Roman Catholicism. Then it was Mormonism, and on down from there, as far as the number of debates were concerned. So I have, in that process, I have dealt with many former Protestants, both on the professional level. Jerry Matitix was a former Protestant. Uh, Robertson Genis. Uh, many of the people that we did, we debated in long in the uh, great debate series, were former Roman Catholics. Uh, for, I'm sorry, former Protestants. Some of them former Reformed uh, individuals. But then that office obviously led to uh, written interactions with meetings with uh, communication with all sorts of people who were not apologists, but likewise made the journey to Rome. And of course, there is a massive number of people. Uh, Rome has has hemorrhaged uh, people for good and bad reasons. Uh, the clergy scandal continues to. I mean, uh, Ireland is filled with former Roman Catholics, but most of them were Roman Catholics nominally to begin with. They were they were cultural Roman Catholics. They they weren't Roman Catholics of commitment, and large portion of those who've left Reformed churches, I'm not saying to say just Protestant churches, but Reformed churches and become Roman Catholic. Um, that's a different, that's different. It's hard to be, it, it is possible to be nominally Reformed, but truly Reformed churches really do their best to make sure that that is not a possibility, just by the way the preaching is done and, and, and so on and so forth. So there have been a few truly knowledgeable Reformed people that I have sat down and talked with. I've talked about a couple of these conversations in the past. And when I speak with such individuals and I truly press them on the issue of the gospel, uh, that is when I really come to, to recognize that these were individuals who had never truly, even though they had preached it, they had never truly seen their utter dependence upon the work of Christ in their behalf, not just to make something possible. Reformed people don't believe in possibility of salvation. They believe in accomplished salvation. It's one of the major differences between monergists and synergists. And so, uh, but the point is, I've, I've dealt with a lot of folks. And it's interesting, a lot of the people that I've known that have gone into Roman Catholicism, I remember a uh, young fellow that was in our chat channel for a while. Many of them are very attracted uh, by the, the intellectual aspects, and uh, uh, they want to become like Thomas Aquinas or something like that. Um, many of those folks, when they were on their journey, said nothing about it to me. I found out only later on, after it was all, all said and done, which you would think if they actually wanted to have some answers at some point in time, they might have thought that, yeah, you've done more debates with Roman Catholics than almost anybody else has, uh, written books on the subject. Maybe, maybe you might have some insight into this. Well, um, that's that's the rare the rare situation. Anyways, what brings all of this up is a uh, something that Cameron Bertuzzi put on Facebook yesterday. I think it was yesterday. Um, yeah, it said 29 minutes, and so this was at 7, so was sometime yesterday. Uh, under his, the, the name that he used is Capturing Christianity. Uh, on uh, YouTube, his YouTube page, it says... Uh, uh, I'm exposing you to the intellectual side of Christian belief. Okay. And what he, what he posted was, I'm closer to accepting Catholicism than I've ever been. I'm still quite far away, to be sure, but I'm closer than I once was. Um, some of you remember that, I don't remember what it was, might have been last year, might have been earlier this year, um, I went through 
a discussion that he had, uh, that Cameron had with uh, Matt Frad, I think is the guy's name, a nice Aussie Catholic apologist. And basically what I said was, Cameron, you, you don't know why you aren't a Catholic. It's obvious. You don't know why you're a non-Catholic. You're a non-Catholic of taste, not of conviction. You don't know what the Reformation was about. You don't seem to know anything about the history of the Roman Catholic Church. You don't know anything about the history of your own church, if you even claim a particular church as far as fidelity to its doctrinal statements. And that puts you in a, in a really difficult position to be able to find, provide any kind of meaningful response to a Roman Catholic apologist who's throwing out standard Roman Catholic arguments that would require you to have a knowledge of why it is that we actually stand against what Rome has said about these subjects historically. Well, those videos have continued coming out, and uh, we noted, uh, I went through over the past couple of weeks, some claims about Mary and, and issues regarding the saints and things like that from another uh, video. So I wasn't stunned to, to read, I'm closer to accepting Catholicism than I've ever been. When you hear somebody saying that, they are in the cleanup stage. Because, you see, if you really understand Rome's claims, if you, if you for example, listen to Roman Catholic apologists, listen to Roman Catholic radio, they are constantly talking about coming to the church, not coming to a local assembly, but their conversion stories are about coming to Rome, to the church. Our conversion story is about coming to Christ, theirs are coming to the church. You can't continuously expose yourself to those claims without recognizing that there is a, it's an either or. It's, it's not a both and. You can't, you, you can't stay out there in the middle of, of the Tiber River, which is where he is. He's pretty much over on, that, on the far side shore. You know, his toes are touching the rocks on the other side. Um, he's just still neck deep in, in the really ugly water of the Tiber. It's just, uh, if you've ever been there, it's just a little... Maybe, maybe that day it was just really bad. I don't know. But when I visited Rome, it was... Not something I want to go swimming. And I didn't, I didn't notice anybody else was either. I'm not sure if that means anything. Anyhow, um, and so I, one of the things that I have emphasized, and, and I think I'm not going to be making many friends today, but the reality is the vast majority of non-Catholics today are Catholics of taste and not are, are non-Catholics of taste, not of conviction. It's, it's what I've been raised with. I'm, I'm comfortable with a Calvary Chapel style worship service, and I'm not into smells and bells, and I'm not into uh, candles, and um, you know, I like a ni nice worship band type thing. That wasn't an option in the 16th and 17th centuries. And hence, when you go back and actually read what men wrote back then and the lives they lived, you recognize that they saw that the issues at hand were issues of life and death. And of course, for quite some time after the Reformation, they were issues of life and death on both sides. On both sides. Um, I... Last time I was in London, last couple of times that I was in London, I hope I get to go to London again someday, but I don't know. Um, I ran over to the Three Marian Martyrs Monument, and also it's also within the same spot where um, Wallace was, was killed. Um, but all over, you'll find these monuments to martyrs, and they were martyrs to the Roman Catholic Protestant divide. And 
Rome has a tremendous amount of blood on its hands, and it claims to be infallible, so you got to deal with that. Uh, Protestants responded the same way because of sacralism, the state church. And we've gone into depth talking about this in the past and what that led to and issues in Reformation and, and things like along those lines. But the point is that many, many, many people in those days wrote about the differences, not the way we do in social media today, but because they felt that these were matters of life and death. They're, they're matters of, the, the gospel was at issue. Today, we have an entire cadre of young William Lane Craig wannabes who have embraced the mere Christianity model. The Christianity can be boiled down to sort of the Trinity, the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus, and some kind of generic supernaturalism. And so you, you minimize the target and you, you get your historical minimal facts arguments together and you, you, you get your Kalam cosmological argument all tuned up and ready to go and off you go to war. We have criticized this movement many, many times, and we've been very consistent over the decades of saying that's not enough because that's not apostolic. That's not what the apostles did. That wasn't the apostolic message. The apostolic message was never a bare theism. It was never a classical theism. Not only was it a Trinitarian theism, it was a theism that involved God and time, so much so that Paul, after only a short number of sentences in speaking to the Athenian philosophers, informed them that God would judge them by a man whom he had appointed, a man whom he had raised from the dead, which ended his sermon very quickly. Point was that the gospel and what Christ did, not just the, the irony of the mere Christianity movement is that you can absolutely insist that Christ had to have died from, had to have been crucified and risen from the dead, but you can't tell anybody what that actually means. It, it means he was a special person unlike anybody else, but you can't tell anybody that that death, burial, and resurrection actually accomplishes anything. Because that gets into the gospel, and oh, there's just too many differences of opinion, and so we're just, we're just not going to go there. So, there are a lot of... What I'm saying is I am very concerned about the spiritual health of a lot of what it calls itself a, a Christian apologetics in the United States today. And this is true not only for those who just want to sort of do the atheist, theist thing over and over and over and over and over and over and over again, but for those involved in ministry to Muslims, for example, there are many who are excellent at going after the Quran or going after Muhammad and talking about the Hadith and, and everything else. But when it comes to the gospel, when it comes to the message of life that must be delivered to the Muslim people, that which will actually set them free, all of a sudden, not so clear, not so compelling at all. And if there's anything that I would hope that my Muslim friends would say, they would say one thing about that James White guy is he's always getting to the gospel. And we, we know what, what he's saying. I, I think really of, uh, I'll, I'll never forget, standing in the mosque in Erasmus, South Africa, with the Muslims sitting on the ground right in front of me, talking about my unworthiness 
to be the recipient of God's grace and, and how my heart strays and how they know the same thing is true of them. And therefore, how can any one of us truly have peace with, with, with a truly holy God? Um, that's not the normal presentation, unfortunately, of many apologists to Islam. There are some. I'm certainly not saying I'm the only one, but there is a general malaise soteriologically amongst those who uh, deal with the Muslim people. And so apologists as a whole, I think, need to be, you know, I've said forever, it, there is no office of apologist. If you're, if you're interested in apologetics, great, fine, wonderful, you better be involved in the church. And I don't mean just showing up once in a while. I mean ministry in the church. If, if you aren't involved in that level of teaching within the local body, apologetics isn't for you. You will eventually um, get in trouble. Get in tr I've, I've seen it so many times. Man, I, I remember one guy, whew, he knew more about Jehovah's Witnesses than anybody I'd ever met. He really did. And then one day I get a phone call. He had become a Jehovah's Witness. And he was never a churchman. That, that ministry to Jehovah's Witnesses was all he was. And that's dangerous. Very, very dangerous. Uh, it just shouldn't, shouldn't be. So I tweeted about the fact that I was going to talk about this statement. And... In my experience, someone in, Car uh, in Cameron's position uh, might think they're still quite far away, but I've read most of the convert books, you know, the Surprised by Truth series. And it's a common element of those conversion stories that someone thought they were far away, and then it was just one issue, and they went, oh, then I saw that this was the case, and everything just fell like dominoes after that. Um, what his words tell me is he does not, has either never understood or has decided he was wrong in having understood this at some point in the past. That Rome's gospel is a gospel that falls under the anathema of Paul in Galatians 1. This is the issue. I, I really wish it were not the case. There are Roman Catholics that I have tremendous respect for, and we fight many of the same battles, and I really wish that this wasn't the case, but here's the fact. When Paul wrote to the churches in Galatia, he did not bring a laundry list of theological errors concerning the teachers in Galatia. He didn't say they're wrong about who God was and Jesus was and the Bible was and, and everything else. He said there was one thing. There was, there was one thing. They were forcing Gentiles to be circumcised, to enter into the Old Covenant before they could enter into the New Covenant. Just, it was just one thing. Faith in Jesus was still important. Don't get me wrong. Um, they were saying you had to believe in Jesus. They, they were saying that Jesus rose from the dead. He was the Messiah. There's no indication of any lack of, of orthodoxy on their part in those other areas. They're just doing one thing. You need to enter into the Old Covenant, and then from the Old Covenant you can enter into the New Covenant by faith, but you've, you've got to do something else. Just one thing. And Paul said, anathema. A curse by God. Now, when you look at Rome's gospel, when you look at her teaching 
on the Mass as a propitiatory sacrifice. When you understand that you can approach the cross of Christ in Roman Catholicism 30,000 times in your life and not be perfected, and in fact, still go to hell. Not according to the current Pope, I'm sure, but according to historic Roman Catholic teaching. You could be a regular mass-attending Roman Catholic, commit a mortal sin before your death, and be lost. No purgatory. You have to be in a state of grace to go to purgatory. And so, when you look at what the Mass doesn't accomplish, and hence what the death of Christ doesn't accomplish, when you look at the entire sacramental system, when you look at baptism, when you look at justification, when you look at the, the concept of confession to a priest, an altar Christus, another Christ, you put all these together, and the distance between the message of grace that is found in the New Testament gospel and what Rome teaches is massive. I wish it were not that way. I hope and pray that there are many within the external bounds of the Roman Catholic communion that do not believe those things, that actually have a belief, a trust in Jesus, and don't let these other things get in the way. I, I hope that's the case, but the reality is that the teachings, the official dogmatic teachings of the Church, fall under the anathema of the Apostle Paul, and hence the anathema of Scripture itself. So a number of people, some of the responses that I saw, amazing postmodern responses. How dare I say something like this to, to Cameron? I, I mean, how dare you question his journey? It's like, wow, has postmodernism just... These people would not read three sentences of Erasmus and, and Luther going at it before they'd faint and run for a safe space. I mean, wow. <laughs> That's like, really? Okay, all right. Um, this isn't an issue about someone's journey. This is about what the gospel is. And that's more important than any individual person is. Or their feelings or their emotions. Me or him. We just got to grow up in this culture and got to grow up in the church. There was just a tremendous amount of childishness in response to my just saying, hey, here's an obvious example. It has been demonstrated in the videos that Cameron doesn't know what he believes. He's far more comfortable talking about the Kalam cosmological argument and its various permutations than he is about the imputed righteousness of Christ. That's a fact. And if he can't see it, I can't help him. He just needs to be honest. That, that's a reality. I'll bet you anything. Cameron, you've read seven times more pages, minimally, on Kalam than you have on justification, haven't you? Haven't you? It's true. If I were to ask you for the classical Protestant works dealing with a refutation of the claims of Rome. Would you have any idea without Googling it? Don't worry. Nobody else would either. Sadly. Most people have never heard of Whitaker. If they're Lutheran, they've never heard of Chemnitz. They've probably never read Salmon's Infallibility of the Church. That's the reality. But the fact is, you demonstrated that in your conversations. You don't know your history. Whatever church you're involved with right now, it just doesn't seem you have any idea where it came from, what its particular distinctives are, why that's important specifically in regards to Rome. 
Does your church have a meaningful statement of faith? I mean, we use the London Baptist Confession of Faith of 1689. I can guarantee you something. You cannot read that statement of faith without encountering refutation after refutation of the specific claims of Rome. Because that's where we came from. That's what was going on in 1689. And if you don't understand what Rome claims about those things, you're never really going to understand the specifics of what the Confession of Faith says. But other people, and this is why I wanted to address this, other people were asking the question, what's the attraction? Why would people be attracted to this? Now, some of these people are former Roman Catholics themselves, and I've, I've noticed that former Roman Catholics really struggle with this convert syndrome because they're like, I've been through all of the, all the stuff. I, I've, I've, I've been through all the pageantry and, 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 the, and the whole nine yards, and it was empty, and, and it never satisfied, and I never heard the gospel there. And so they really struggle with why there is an attraction at all. And I get that. Nominal Roman Catholicism, nominal Eastern Orthodoxy, not attractive at all. I mean, if you're going to go for it, you got to go, go for the whole thing. Be real. But having said that, if you don't understand what the attraction is, you're probably you're going to be in danger yourself of falling for it. Because you need to understand, it can be very attractive to certain kinds of people looking for certain things. If a person wants a deep spiritual experience that is attached to imagery, maybe music, sensory uh, experiences of candles and smells, uh, a large cathedral room that makes you feel small and makes, you, makes the transcendent feel like it is touching you. Especially the concept of the ancient church standing in the mists of time, unchanging, stable, oh man, especially in these days where everything changes overnight. Everything changes overnight anymore. There's nothing stable. And so many people want to have that which is going to be abiding and true and it's, it's ancient and it's, it's not the, the simplistic type of evangelicalism where you, you go in and you get all emotionally revved up by some happy, clappy praise choruses and you, you get a 20-minute sermonette about how, how much God loves you and how crazy he is about you. Um, and then you just go about your week. A lot of people get tired of that if that's all you get. I get that. Or maybe the big mega church entertainment stuff, you know, it looks more like a rock show than it does a worship service. There's nothing transcendent about it. It, change, it. it changes every little bit like everything else does. Or maybe I've seen people go to Rome who are part of churches that were not into the happy clappy stuff, but they are also deader than the proverbial doornail. There wasn't a call for holiness or depth of spiritual experience or a challenge of anybody. They hadn't done church discipline on anybody since the Civil War. And so there's lots of reasons why people will find dissatisfaction where they are, and some of those reasons are valid reasons. And so we need to recognize there can be real attraction to the claim that this is the church that Christ founded. And you split off from us. We stand in the, the very mists of time. It can be very attractive. So much so that I've met many a convert who, even when I showed them 
that that claim is simply false on its face and can be disproven in so many different ways on a purely historical ground. Just, just the very documents of history itself, the, 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 the utilization of forgeries by Roman Catholicism to establish the papacy and the fact that the, there was no papacy in Rome at first. There was a plurality of elders there. Didn't develop till around, didn't have a, a monarchical episcopate there until about 140 and the development of all of the sacramental systems and the fact that you didn't have priests at first and that developed out of the, out of the presbytery and, and all of the threads that had to come together to form purgatory and just all the developments and really even the, the non-Christian sources that gave rise to the Marian dogmas and the, the Protevangelium of James and, and all that kind of stuff. Once a person is bitten with the bug of ancient, the ancient church, it's amazing what they can do, even when faced with all the facts that say, nah, it's not the ancient church. Or even when you provide a, a meaningful explanation for how the ancient church exists to this day. The spirit indwelt people of God who are concerned about continuing to believe and proclaim the apostolic message of the Lordship of Christ, which is found for us and provided for us in that which is Theonustos, God breathed, the scriptures. Even when you provide them with that and, and show them how Christ has been building his church, and he's continuing to build his church. And he's never stopped building his church. Man, once that person grabs hold of this, I can have this ancient church. It rem they'll, they'll do what they need to do to continue to hold to that concept. That's just it's been my experience. Now, my experience also is there seems to be a honeymoon stage where Rome can do no wrong. All the things that former Roman Catholics are going, man, have you seen this? That this is why this happened. That's I left because of that. During the honeymoon stage, the the new spouse is always perfect in all ways. But the honeymoon stage eventually fades. fades. I hate to tell those of you who are just about to get married, but it, it does. And so I have seen people who made the made the leap. They made the switch. They, they swam the Tiber. And then years later, they write and they say, well, you were right. Eventually, the pomp, the circumstance, the, the incense, the, 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 the genuflecting, there actually had to be a, an actual foundation to it. it. It needed to be consistent with Scripture and and I saw how inconsistent the priesthood of Rome was, not only in its life and behavior, but certainly in its handling of Scripture. And, and I started realizing that I had traded one, what I thought was set of confusions, for another set of confusions, that there's Roman Catholics who believe everything. The, the view, the, the, the range of expression... Uh, Roman Catholicism is just as wise as it is in Protestantism. Just go, to, just go to Boston College, sit in a few classes, listen to those priests up there and what they're saying. Some of them are barely even theists. Rome won't do anything about them. Rome won't get rid of them. There's a huge amount of variation. And jumping on to the, jumping into the papacy, following the papacy, especially these days, um, doesn't doesn't accomplish anything. Does not accomplish anything. And in fact, right now, especially it 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 would seem that right now with Francis, how do you make that argument right now? I don't even. Wow, you it's it's tough. It. It's a challenge. But don't underestimate, do not underestimate that attraction. Do not underestimate that attraction. 
So, as we've said many times before, if you're paddling around in the middle of the Tiber River, what you need to do is you need to get that boat over to the western shore, drag it up on the, on the side, break it up, build a pulpit, and start calling the people, not only who are out in the Tiber, but on the far bank in Rome, out to a gospel that actually gives them peace to a gospel of a powerful Savior who doesn't need the, the merits of Mary and the saints, doesn't need all of that extraneous stuff that clearly distracts from the worship of the one true God. It's not an aid. It's not a lower form of veneration. It is a distraction. It's idolatry. Build yourself a pul pulpit out of the wood from that boat you're paddling around in and start preaching the gospel with clarity, a gospel that actually brings peace. Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Not a ceasefire. Peace with God. Peace with God. So some thoughts about um, converts. It happens every year. You, you see it all the time. Um, but there you go. Uh, real quickly, last night, um, I was... Let me see if I can find a... Yeah, this is, that's, a, that's a good screenshot. I'm not going to play it. Um, but here is a um, screenshot. Good old Steven Anderson's back. I, I think it's a new channel because YouTube wiped him out. They, they just... Took everything, I think the whole church page and everything out. And so he's got something else going on now. And by the way, let me just mention, um, I don't think that YouTube should have taken him out because they're just moving up from the bottom. <laughs> they're going to get to everybody eventually. Um, that's all there is to it. Let us, in an adult society, you let people have free speech and then you let adults hash it out and ignore what is worthless, refute what needs to be refuted. You don't. Censorship is the last refuge of a decaying and dying society. And we have it happening all the time. But what you've got here, uh, this was posted in one of the groups that I'm in. And people are going, well, how do you respond to this? And I'm, I'm a little concerned that even amongst Reformed folks, there is the, well, somebody used an original language, and so therefore they, they must have some weight behind it or something like that. Uh, it's only about six minutes long or something like that. But this is Anderson's demonstration that there is a textual variant in the Greek Septuagint uh, at Hosea 11.1 1, that everybody already knew there was one. When I say everyone, I mean everyone who would be interested as to whether there are textual variants in the Greek Septuagint, which, of course, there are. There are lots of them. And, in fact, I've found it um, really interesting to preach from the Septuagint. Because when I preach from the Greek Septuagint, especially if you're preaching from a text you know, when I taught the Isaiah 6 passage, um, I used those two beautiful Jeffrey Rice rebinds of the Greek Septuagint uh, to preach from Genesis and Isaiah a few weeks ago at church. And when you look at it, there's almost... there's there's. Almost no passage that you could possibly run into are you not going to find some variation between the Greek Septuagint and the Hebrew text that we have today, which is, in general, the Biblia Hebraica Stuttgartensia is the Masoretic text, with one S. I spelled it with two S's in something recently, and my, my computer thinks they're both misspelled. So <laughs> my computer doesn't know. But anyway... Um, the Masoretic text, the Hebrew text, and then the Greek Septuagint. Um, you'll, you'll, there's lots of, of variations. 
And so what he does is he goes through and he goes through the uh, Hebrew and set and points out that so uh, this is you know Mitzrayim is is Egypt prefixed min the new has been a, a, assimilated here you can see that uh, with uh, the form of the second uh, mem there and so out of Egypt and let me s move an arm here yeah there it is uh, Kara to call, I have called my son, my son. So uh, this is the messianic prophecy found in um, Hosea 11. 1. And then when it's quoted in the New Testament, notice it says, Ekala Satan Huyan Mu called my son, but in the Septuagint that he is citing, he has metakalasa ta tekna autu. So, in the... And he didn't identify, at least not that I heard. Maybe he didn't, I missed it. But he didn't identify what Septuagint he was utilizing. Whether he has any critical editions of the Greek Septuagint, whether he has the, the Göttingen Septuagint, which is sort of the most extensive uh, version of the Septuagint available today, as far as textual critical material and things like that, because I, I don't know. But there is no question that Ta Tekna Autu is different than Tan Huyan Mu. This is, out of Egypt, have I called his children his children, uh, which would, which would be the him would, would be loved him. That's Israel. So I've called the children of Israel out of Egypt is what is, is the idea of this form of the Greek Septuagint. But Tan Huyan Mu is what's in the New Testament. So his whole idea is the Septuagint is corrupt. And the Septuagint that Matthew was quoting was different than the Septuagint we have today. Well, this, of course, begs the issue of what is the Septuagint we have today. It is very, very plain that the Septuagint was not translated by 70 scholars uh, at one time. They all went into their caves and came back out with the exact same translation, and therefore this was God's demonstration. Though lots of Christians believe that was the case. A lot of Christians in the early centuries from the 2nd to the 5th centuries, maybe even beyond that, did believe that story and did place um, inspired weight, maybe we the term I could use, in the Greek Septuagint. And hence, I've mentioned before, the riot that broke out in Carthage when Jerome's Vulgate was, written, uh, was read publicly and it changed some of the wording had to change some of the wording between that and the Greek Septuagint, and people just found that horrific. I use that as an illustration of how a text can become a standardized text. So the Septuagint became a standardized text, then it was replaced by the Vulgate. When the Vulgate first comes out, there's resistance, but 1,100 years later, Erasmus is dealing, is being attacked for daring to question the readings of the Vulgate, which was once the new kid on the block. So what um, Anderson demonstrates here is that there is a variant in the Greek Septuagint, which surprises absolutely positively no one uh, who understands anything about Septuagint studies. But what he didn't recognize is if he had gone into the, the Göttingen uh, Greek Septuagint, I will, uh, let me take this down here. Unfortunately, um, this is a uh, is is really super small, and if I blow it up, it it gets really difficult. But uh, I have the apparatus open here, and down here at the bottom, 
you will see a little alpha with a prime, uh, sort of like a, a acute accent next to it. But you see the line after it's Tan Huyan Mu. Tan Huyan Mu. So this is Aquila. This is Aquila's reading of the Greek Septuagint. Aquila's reading of the Greek Septuagint is the same as the New Testament renders it. Symmachus's reading is Huyasmu. And Theodotion is Huyanmu, which is just the article different than what you have over here. So two versions of the Septuagint have the accusative singular Huyan with the genitive mu, the possessive mu, and one has huyas, which is the nominative uh, mu. And then others you have are ta tekna, autu, which is what we have in the printed edition, which is evidently what Anderson was referring to. What this shows us, remember, Anderson's a King James onlyist, a strange King James onlyist anymore. It, very, very unique in all ways. But he's still influenced by, I mean, he will identify Ruckmanites as crazy people, and so they identify him as crazy people. And the infighting, it's funny, because when he came here to this office, what year was that? 2016, 17? Somewhere around there? Maybe even been earlier than that. Might have been like 2015. Hmm. Well, anyway, when he came here to interview me for that movie he did, um, it was funny how quick, quick he was to get into the kind of bickering that independent fundamentalist Baptists are known for. He was talking about um, his arguments with Sam Gipp to me. Um, and then some of the eschatological stuff that they were getting into and, and uh, he and other people and stuff. And th this is, this is what IFB folks are, are really all about. Uh, they, they like to fight with each other, but he's different. He's, he's, um, <clears throat> really hard to, to, to nail down. Most of your King James only folks are not reading Greek and Hebrew. I mean, he showed a good basic level knowledge there, just reading, you know, like anyone in first year Greek or Hebrew would be able to read the letters and pronounce them properly and so on and so forth. Recognize what's going on with it. And he proves that there's a textual variant. What he didn't go into is there is no single Septuagint. The Septuagint itself has multiple streams of transmission, just as the Masoretic text, uh, uh, scribes had to make textual critical decisions in the ninth century to come up with their extremely stable text. And there were multiple Hebrew streams in the days of Jesus as well, which is why we have variants in such places as Hebrews chapter 8, where clearly there were Hebrew texts that, said, that had Baal, others that had Gaal, and you have Greek translations of both of those. So the interplay of the various traditions, and these are textual traditions, not traditions as in the Korban rule or something like that. There's, there's a textual use of that term. Um, go back to the time of Christ himself. And, that, and that's, what's, that, that's a problem for King James only people, sometimes TR only people, is to, is to deal with the reality that the New Testament writers recognize these things and dealt with these things themselves. Um, so I wanted to, that was put out there last night, and I wanted to go, yeah, well, that doesn't actually prove anything because here's evidence that you had multiple streams and that there was a stream of Greek that is behind at least two of the major early versions that include the Greek Septuagint that had my son, whether with the article or without the article. Uh, that, was, uh, that was there. Now, oh, goodness. Uh, well, we've, oh, we've only gone 
An hour, right? Hour? Oh, really? Oh, okay. Right, that's what I thought. I was like, go ahead, blame the, blame the computer. Okay, fine. Um, yeah, I know. So I did say we would get to this, so we'll finish up with this. Uh, this is a... Man, these kids look younger and younger every day. This is a very young man a asking Dr. Frank Turk a question about Molinism. We dealt with Molinism yesterday. No, I am not going to repeat the 20-minute description of Molinism <laughs> that I provided yesterday. Um, but it is important, I think, to recognize how these theories end up functioning. If you want to see how this really plays out, um, I, uh, oh man, three years ago at least, put together and we posted on YouTube the section from Dr. Turek's debate with David Silverman and the corresponding section from my debate with David Silverman, answering the same question from David Silverman. That is a really excellent example of how apologetic methodology differs and the end result thereof. Um, so I would direct you to that. But here, this young man asks... Uh, a question, and the, the response he gets is is interesting. So let's um, let's listen to this. Uh, he uses their wicked actions for his good, er, mm -hmm. for his glory. Whoops, I, that's uh, that went too far. Here we go. Well, a moment ago, uh, and in a debate, excuse me, in a debate with I believe his name is David Silverman, yes. a couple of years back, uh, and a moment ago, in your answer to a gentleman just a few questions before me, you advocated a view known as Molinism. Yeah. My question is, how do you get that from the Bible? Because God even says he uses, I um, can't remember which group it is, as an axe in his hand against Isaiah the Israelites. 10. He uses their wicked actions for his good, or mm -hmm. for his glory. How do you get the view of Molinism out of that, him using wicked actions and him using people's evil choices for himself? Okay, so what the, the text that the young man is referring to is a text that I, I preached on recently at Apologia Church, uh, where I did um, Genesis 50, Isaiah 10, and Acts uh, chapter 4, and it's the Isaiah 10, where God wields the axe, and uh, he brings the Assyrians against Israel, but that's not what they intend, and, and so on and so forth. And Molinism, of course, what they intend is all important. Remember yesterday? Autonomous creatures, free autonomous creatures, free autonomous creatures, over and over and over and over and over again. Uh, how does God deal with these things in light of the fact that this is what he has to deal with? And so those texts don't talk about free autonomous creatures. They talk about a free autonomous God using creatures to his own honor and glory. That's, that's what Genesis 50 is. He's going to bring up Genesis 50, Isaiah 10, and Acts chapter 4 are, are really all about. And so the, the young man is saying, how do you get Molinism out of the Bible when the Bible is specifically stating that God doesn't, it's not just God actuating possible worlds, he's actually sovereignly in charge of evil actions that these individuals uh, engage in. Not just micromanaging the circumstances around so that it's just their will that's involved, he, he actually clearly has a decree is really what's being asked. I'd have to look at the context of the passage you're talking about. I don't know what you're referring to, but God can get his will done even through the evil acts of people. That certainly is true. In fact, you can look at, say, uh, Genesis chapter 50, where Joseph of the Old Testament is sold into slavery earlier in the book by his brothers, and then somehow he rises to prominence in Egypt. And his family flees Israel to try and escape a famine. They come to Egypt looking for food. Joseph has all this food stored up, and he's in a position of power. He could have looked down at them and said, you guys sold me into slavery. Now you're going to pay. I'm going to take vengeance. He doesn't say that. 
What he says is what you meant for evil, God meant for good, the saving of many lives that is happening right now. So God can turn evil into good. Now, catch that. God can turn evil into good. That's not what Genesis 50, 20 says. You, he quoted it correctly. But tradition can be such a strong filter that you don't hear what you're saying. He quoted it correctly. You intended it for evil. God intended it for good. Not you originated the act and then God redeemed it. There was intentionality on the part of both. And obviously, one of the two can see the future and one cannot. And it's God. So God's intention was for good to save many lives as it is to this day. Specifically, their lives and the lives of their families and the lives of what we would call Israel as a whole, but many other lives too, including Egyptian lives. That was intentional on God's part. This is not a situation. He has put it into the context where the brothers act first and then God responds to their action. Remember, when you actually read the story, that the brothers wanted to kill Joseph. God keeps that from happening. Now, do you think it was just happenstance that there happened to be a caravan going to Egypt coming by at that very point? where he keeps them from killing Joseph? That just just happened? No. God has a decree that he is accomplishing. Molinism does not deny to God the ability to micromanage events, but what it does is limit the freedom of God's decree based upon the content of middle knowledge, and where that content comes from, no one knows. It doesn't come from the free choice of God. There is the real issue. Yes, sir. I just found his characterization that Joseph gets to Egypt and somehow finds his way up in the government authority. Yeah, where, where, the like, whole, where the whole point of Genesis is God was doing all of this stuff. Uh, it's, yeah. I don't, I don't know how that happened. It just did, you know? Yeah. Well, there is an, a, a, the, some people are averse to the working out of God's sovereign decree in time, but it's there. Yes, my question is, how do you get that out of a Molinistic system where you have God looking through the options and saying, you know, this is the one where the most people come to me or the ratio will be right? How do you get it? Well, Molinism basically means that God knows all counterfactuals. It comes from, a, uh, a uh, uh, for those of you who don't know, a theologian by the name of Molina who said he's trying to resolve the, the, the free will predestination problem. And he says, God knows all counterfactuals. He knows how you would act in a certain set of conditions. And, and again, especially because I can't assume everyone has watched the last program, and just because you tune in for this program or something like that, even a tuned in, what does that even mean anymore? But anyway, uh, uh, you clicked, clicked through, whatever it is. Um, the, it, it's not just God knows counterfactuals. <clears throat> It's that God is endowed, to use William Lane Craig's language, endowed with the ability to know what free creatures would do in any given circumstance without God decreeing to make the creature. That's what middle knowledge is. It's between God's natural knowledge of himself and his free knowledge of what he chooses to create. It's between the two, so it can be logically prior to the second aspect of knowledge. That's why it's called middle knowledge. So that, that, that's very, very important, because that's the only way to, for the system to work to try to save the autonomy of man, is to make man something that is defined by something outside of God. So if God can know what you're going to do in any given circumstance before God decrees to create you, then you have a level of being that is outside of the creative will of God. And I say 
That's absurd. I am who I am because God made me in this way. He placed me in certain circumstances. He made me with certain capacities and certain weaknesses. And by placing me with the parents that I have and the family that I have in the churches that I've been in, in the nation that I've been in, he has made me be the person that I am. I am not some cosmic construct named James White that would react in certain circumstances um, and that, that, that constrains God's utilization of me. Because I would, have, and I would have responded differently in the 12th century, so I couldn't have lived in the 12th century, so he's got to run all these different scenarios, and I can only function the way he wants me to function within a per particular time frame, and blah, 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 blah. That's where you get God is just basically a big supercomputer, and I think there's, there's validity in, in what you're saying there, uh, in the criticism of Molinism. But... The proponents of Molinism don't like to really come straight out and say that this knowledge God has, the reason it's called middle knowledge is it's between these two others, and that means it's knowledge that he has of you before he wills to create you. That's, I think, I really, I just like to call on those who are going to promote Molinism as a apologetic methodology or whatever, put that out there. Let people know that you're actually presenting the idea that who they are is determined by someone or something other than God. Because that's what you're saying. That's what you're saying to them. I looked up after the show where you played that, I looked up the word in doubt every which way I could. And what do you mean, every which way I could? Every, oh, look, you go to the encyclopedia, all these different dif dictionaries, looking for every single definition of that word that I could find was passive. Came from someplace else. It came from somewhere else. Yeah. So I find it a, an amazing admission or assertion on his part that he would use that word. Of all words you would choose, he would use that word because that says... Everything we've been saying. Yeah, it, it does. It, it, if that is his way, if that is, and we're talking about William Lane Craig at this point, if William Lane Craig is trying to get around the card dealer problem with saying that God is endowed with this knowledge, he still needs to explain, has this, is this knowledge that he has been eternally endowed with? What is the origin and source of it? Um, there's, there, there aren't any answers to this. Um, there are a lot of people that say, I've, I've found a new way around it. Well, I can guarantee you one thing. The apostles never dreamed of it. Act in a cer another set of conditions. I don't see why anything in the Bible would prevent God from doing that. In fact, there are even... Now, here's, here's what I, why I wanted to play this. Let me, let me back this up. Listen, listen to what is, is said here. I don't find anything in the Bible that would prevent God from... Doing, this is the issue. My assertion is this. You want to do apologetics by presenting Christian truth that is derived from Scripture, not arguments where the best you can say is, well, I can't find anything in Scripture that contradicts it. Those are, that, that's very, that's a very different approach. Very different approach. Let's listen to again how that how that works. Ed, he's trying to resolve the, the, the free will predestination problem. And he says, God knows all counterfactuals. He knows how you would act in a certain set of conditions and how you'd act in a cer another set of conditions. I don't see why anything in the Bible would prevent God from doing that. In fact, there are even passages in the Bible which seem to affirm that. Like, for example, when Jesus said, if these miracles were done in this town, they would have repented. In other words, he knows the counterfactual as to what happened. Now, this is one of the, the few texts that people throw out. But I remember, oh, again, um, within the past decade, I think, uh, William Lane Craig admitting that Molinism is not something that is taught by the apostles. It's not, not taught by inspired writers, but that it's just consistent it's a, it's a later way of understanding that is consistent, but not taught by them. But, and, and he, 
mentioned this text. It says sometimes it's, but that's, that's really not what it's saying. And he's right. It's not what it's saying. I, I disagree. He says this seems to present that. Well, let's, let's think for just a moment. This is, of course, Jesus is talking about Chorazin and Bethsaida. He's talking about the ministry that he has uh, been undertaking there in Galilee. And um, he's warning about the hard-heartedness of the people who are standing in the very presence of the Son of God, but are rejecting his call to repentance and faith in him. And what he's saying is that the miracles that have been done in the streets of Chorazin and Bethsaida, and it's interesting to me, that the one time I, you know, we were supposed to be going over there pretty soon, and that's been moved back again, thanks to the Great Panic of 2020, uh, which will become the Great Panic of 2021 if, if we're not careful. Um, but the one time that I got to go over there, one of the things that was really interesting, I, I loved visiting the synagogues, the first century synagogue in uh, Capernaum, for example. It was just uh, uh, fascinating to look at. Uh, I'm sorry. Um, Migdal, Migdal, not Capernaum. Uh, the, one in, the one in Capernaum is probably second, third. But the first century in Migdal, which there's a 99% chance that Jesus spoke in that, th those ruins, those rocks had heard my Savior speak. It was just fantastic. Anyway, uh, but in Crazy and Bethsaida, they, they can't find those. They've been wiped out, like they were wiped off the earth. Like, like um, Jesus's words of judgment were important words. He said, if, if the miracles that have been done in you were done in the streets of Sodom, Sodom and Gomorrah. Now, what would Sodom and Gomorrah represent to the people of that day? Absolute evil. So what is Jesus doing here? Is Jesus actually giving a lesson in counterfactuals? Or is he giving a lesson in judgment? Is he not saying to people who think they're righteous that they're actually less righteous and less sensitive to the ministrations of God? than the people of old that they used as an example of what it means to be truly evil, which was Sodom and Gomorrah. What do you think is more likely? That this is a judgment passage from Jesus saying, you people are so hard that even the men of Sodom and Gomorrah would have repented at the miracles you've seen, or is he giving a philosophical discussion of counterfactuals? What do you think? Yeah, I think it's pretty obvious. I think God, being all-knowing, knows all different scenarios of how we'd react under different circumstances. Okay, and how come that system was only developed 1,500 years after the New Testament? Good question. Good question, especially if it is necessary to be able to interpret what the text says. There is, there is an appropriate level in, in this question to point out that really, now some people really argue that um, there was an Anabaptist writer just, you know, what, what would that be, 30 years prior, maybe, to Louis de Molina, the Jesuit. Uh, so there are some who try to say that the Anabaptist came up with this first, but you're still, you're still talking 1,500 years after the time of Christ, either, either one before someone comes up with this idea that God has a form of knowledge that no one had ever thought of before. We somehow managed to work through the Trinity and the hypostatic union and resurrection, all the rest of that stuff, never came up with this stuff. All of a sudden, the Reformation, and it wasn't, it wasn't the Reformers who came up with this. Um, it was others. I don't know why that would be a pride. I think it's in the New Testament. It might be that someone first recognized it 1,500 years later. Just What? How can it... So it's in the New Testament, but wasn't recognized for 1,500 years later? Because he just, he just said, I think it's in the New Testament. So I think what he's saying is that one verse that he just gave means it's in the New Testament. That was actually a discussion of counterfactuals rather than a judgment 
proclamation. Um, but then it wasn't recognized. So is, is that an admission that, yeah, no one actually looked at Jesus's woes upon Grays and Bethsaida in the same way I do for at least 1,500 years? Um, I'm not sure if that's what's going on there or not. John Calvin. I mean, John Calvin's 1,500 years after the New, New Testament, too. He's the one talking about it. Augustine, of course, talked about it in the 400s A.D. No, wait a minute. I think I missed a word there. That would be a pride. I think it's in the New Testament. It might be that someone first recognized it 1,500 years later. Just like John Calvin. I mean, John Calvin's 1,500 years after the New, New Testament, too. He's the one talking about it. Augustine, of course, talked about it in the 400s A.D. But people analyzing the scriptures come up with different doctrines all the time, and you have to evaluate, no matter when they emerge, whether or not they're true. Yeah. I'm hard, having a hard time with that one. I, I think the unstated subject of the talking about that one is predestination. But then he admits Augustine was talking about it, and of course <laughs> we've demonstrated others are talking about that much earlier than that. But that's not parallel in, in any way, shape, or form to Molinism. Molinism really is, is a theological novum. So I guess what he's saying is, hey, theological novums are cool. People come up with new theologies every day. Well, no, that's not true. Um, are, are you literally saying that there's just all sorts of stuff we haven't yet discovered in the New Testament, or, and that's a good thing or an okay thing? Thank you. All right. Good question, Jackson. Thank you. Yeah. So there you go. Um, I, I, I don't think that Molinism um, acquits itself real well, biblically, especially as it is being utilized to provide some kind of stuff. Uh, I am restraining myself from addressing some textual critical issues. I want to. I have the video to. <laughs> but I'm restraining myself because we are attempting to set up uh, some opportunities. And so I'm, 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 yeah, really biting my tongue. Maybe I'll get to tell you some more about it sometime in the future, uh, especially if this works out to where we can get a debate going on, but well, we will see. So, uh, no more programs this week heading to Arkansas, um, for the conference there. Uh, we've posted stuff about that and I saw something just recently that, uh, it's almost the physical space is almost sold out. Um, which is, which is good. It's great. Looking forward to, uh, looking forward to that. Um, but Lord willing be back next week. And we'll see you then. God bless.